Um, welcome. Um, this uh, lecture follows on from the last one. Uh, we had a description of the helper client situation last time that you think of that as one engineer, one person, um, one engineer, one client, one engineer, one member of a community. Okay. Um, the situation, even in that case, is really quite complex, okay? There's a whole philosophy and sort of, some people call it a theory or approach to helping a single individual. And uh, Egan's book gives a very nice description of how to go about that. So uh, we discussed that last time, and I, I can just say that it takes a, a lot of um, skill and practice to be able to do it right. Um, it's, it's really not easy. Um, now we're going to make things worse. Um, so what's going to happen now is we're going to go to the situation um, where we have n people um, in a community, and you know we're going to start discussing how to go about helping um, a, a large group. Okay, and there are differences, but there's similarities too. Okay, a number of the principles from um, the lecture on Monday apply here. For instance, the idea of active listening, listening to what people say they want to do, um, what are they looking for in terms of a goal, an outcome, um, what they think their own problem situation is. That's, those are basics. That applies to the community case directly. It's just there's some, some details, and some of them are important, that, that change. Okay, so we're going to move towards that. Today, um, uh, so so on, on Monday, the, the perspective was from the helping professions. You know, those are, remember, counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, representatives of religion, uh, nurses, doctors, teachers, all of that. Okay, that's sort of a, a methodology for them. And we're, the view is that humanitarian engineering is, um, in large parts of it, a um, helping profession also, and that's why it's relevant. Um, Today's um, lecture is based on a social worker perspective on community development, okay? Now, in the university, the, the people that understand um, poverty um, and problems that people have the most out of any other college is very clearly the College of Social Work, okay? It's certainly not engineering, and it's, it's certainly not many other things. For groups, okay, social work's where it's at. Um, they have an orientation towards not only understanding these complex situations, but towards solving, trying to solve those problems. So, so it's really quite appropriate that we uh, turn to social work um, to try to understand what to do. So what I want to talk, start with is a little bit of a review and, and thinking about putting this together. I, I was really you know, intrigued with uh, Egan's perspective. Oh, yes, question. You're not on the screen. I'm not on the screen. I'm not on either screen. Uh, with Egan's perspective on uh, the driver. Remember he said, he said repeatedly in his book, look, the client's in the driver's seat. They're driving. You're just helping. So I got to thinking about this, and I really like this analogy, so I want to go with it for a minute because I think it's kind of funny in some ways, but it's also quite serious because it's going to teach us something about humanitarian engineering and trying to help someone. So um, life of my life these days, uh, in the last several years, has been to teach my kids to drive, okay? And, uh, and I Googled, uh, you know, this, is, I love this woman's face. She's like, holy cow, look what's coming, watch out. I mean, uh, or this, this girl's face, oh no, I did it wrong. Uh, you know, and I can tell you that, that it is uh, it's stressful. And I'll tell you why, because Every case is different with every one of my children. I'll describe those in a minute. But also, what you're thinking about is the stuff on the right, okay? Um, you're worried about, well, with my one daughter, this. With all my kids, this, okay? And you know what I'm talking about. With my one daughter, well, my one daughter, this, okay? And of course, you're thinking about this. And I just ran across this photo and I was shocked, and so I just included it for heck of it. It shows that adults even do completely ridiculous things in cars. I mean, look at that. It's a Range Rover. He's on two wheels, and that guy's underneath, and he drove over top of it. Wow. Okay? Now, uh, here's the thing. Daughter number one. Go to teacher. 
Okay, this, this will be relevant, I, trust me. I go to teach her, first thing you do is you go to the nearby neighborhood, drive around the neighborhood. Okay, she one time went off the road, ended up on the sidewalk. Now, I don't know how in the world you do that. Another time she almost hit a lady, okay? Like accidentally hit the gas when she was supposed to hit the brake. And the woman's right there. And you know, I look at the lady and I'm like, sorry. <laughs> you know? I, we finally get out on the road. I almost got killed twice. I'm not kidding. Okay? So, so here's the thing. You go into a situation with someone you're trying to help, with some technology, etc., and you're trying to put them in the driver's seat. Okay? What's going to happen? Is it going to be like with my oldest daughter? I mean, where they're just completely screwing up. You know? And when is it that they're going to get better? I mean, you're trying to empower them. You're trying to enable them. You're trying to teach them so they can handle things on their own in the future, right? I mean, that's what you're trying to do. You're not going to go in and just fix it. I can't drive for my daughter the rest of her life. I don't mind driving around, but I can't drive for her. She's got to learn how to do that. But will it happen? You're in humanitarian engineering. Will they be able, after you walk away and fly back from the U.S., for instance, will they be able to solve problems on their own? That's a, that's a pretty big challenge, I would say. So, for instance, to took this daughter four tries to get her license. One time she was driving on the wrong side of the road. One time she was speeding. One time she almost hit someone during the driving test. So, and, you know, so you think this problem solved now? I've walked away. You think it's problem solved? Not solved. Okay? So, second daughter, get in the car. Go to the neighborhood. Get her in the car. She drives away, and I think, holy cow, she drives at least as good as me, probably better. I mean, from the first moment. And I, I brag about her, and still, she, she seems to drive really well. But, you know, I've been thinking about it. I wonder if that was her first time. Knowing this daughter, she's probably practicing for several years. See, you see, hear what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, so you could get in a humanitarian engineering situation where you get going and it's like, you try to get going and it's like, wow, they just, you know, and you need almost no help. They may even make good recommendations for you. I mean, you can get in that situation in, in humanitarian engineering, which is beautiful. Okay, then there's my son. Okay, this is just funny. Uh, so, so, uh, What's that popular um, driving game on Xbox? Forza. Which one? Forza. No, another Grand one. Grand Theft Auto. What? Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so my son says, Dad, I'm the best driver in the family. And all he's done is once drive up and down the driveway. I'm like, how can that be? You know? And he says, Oh, I've got a lot of hours in on Xbox. <laughs> I mean. So look, I mean, put them in the driver's seat. I think the analogy is actually quite good, um, and if, especially if you're a parent and you have kids. But all of you learned how to drive, I think. And you, you know what I'm talking about in some of these situations. You hear the stories. But this is, a, but Egan's analogy is pretty good because, you know, when you, you're trying to put them in the driver's seat and they're going to drive, they're going to screw up sometimes in important ways, and other times they're going to do really fantastic. And it's hard to know the difference between the two before you get in the car with them and they start trying to drive. Or before you're on the ground with them and they start trying to do engineering with you to fix a problem in the community. It's, it's very difficult. And you have to, as a humanitarian engineer, adjust your style to the person. You know, uh, your, your sort of overall approach to helping. Um, and uh, be ready for anything. You have to be, as Egan says, very flexible. Okay? Uh, and yet, you got to care. I mean, you know, it's 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 a, you know, it's it's quite complicated. I think there's some principles. I mean, you know, like um, don't yell. <laughs> I've heard of some of my friends that they're screaming at their kid because they're about to kill someone or hurt someone. But I think in the end, they just freak out. You just don't do that. So there's there's certain principles on how to approach helping someone. Okay, but it's hard. It, it's really hard. In the end. Okay, so now things are going to get a lot worse, okay? Because now we're going to, you know, in a sense, try to teach N people how to drive the car, okay? So it goes like this. Last time we had one person trying to help them put this piece, puzzle piece in place so they can reach their goal that they set and define. Now we're in this situation. We've got a group 
trying to put, build the bridge, okay? And, and uh, that group, those yellow things there, represent people that could be engineers or community members, okay? Or it might just be community members, they may, you might just turn them loose, okay? And you don't know, you know, this is a, this is a precarious situation, isn't it now? Okay, so these are, these are difficult, these are very tricky things to do. I mean, if you think math is complicated, you know, try people. Um, try groups of people, big groups of people. We're talking about really hard problems. So this is the guy, um, Mark Homan. Uh, he's a professor emeritus in social work. He's done a lot of on the ground, in practice things, and we're, we're talking about this book. If you, um, I mean, there's certain books I recommend. Like Banerjee and Duffalo, I recommend. This is a second book I really would recommend. This, not every chapter of it, but quite a few chapters are really well done. He is very articulate, he writes very well. Okay, so I think um, I can confidently recommend this book. I can recommend Egan's book too. It's, it's, it's really quite well done. Um, okay, so we're gonna build on this client, helper client approach and we're gonna focus on communities. So re why are we gonna focus on communities? Um, well, we're gonna see that humanitarian engineering, the way it's normally practiced um, is, is a bottom-up approach, meaning you help people on the ground. So the normal approach is to work in a community. When I say community though, I think, I'm thinking of uh, many types of communities. I'm not just thinking of this, the village, you know, in Africa or something, or in Latin America, the town, or whatever. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, a community in Franklinton, Columbus. I'm thinking of an educational community, that is a school. Uh, so I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking of a slum. I'm thinking of a, just kind of a group of people living together, sometimes with a common purpose, okay? We're gonna focus on community development. So you know what human development is, we've defined that and discussed it quite a bit already. So now the objective is take N people and develop N people at once. Now, it's complicated because the N people are interacting with each other, right? And they affect each other. They affect each other's education, each other's health, each other's income. So it's a very complicated thing. So the type of community development that humanitarian engineers typically focus on is sort of technology development that is embedded in the community. You go in a community, you all work together to develop a technology. Let's say your civil engineering is to develop, build a bridge, or it's to set up an irrigation system, a sanitation system, a water system. You get everybody to work together and you go forward, okay? Um, another thing is to try to expand the technological capacity in the community via technologies and education. This technological capacity issue is of fundamental importance for humanitarian engineering. We've talked about it a number of ways. We'll spend uh, quite a bit of time in this chapter talking about it. But in, in community development, you don't walk in and, and hide your engineering and just sort of, you know, dole out the magic. You, you teach it. I mean, you teach the principles of how things work. That requires you to understand things very well. You're not going to probably use calculus to explain things or differential equations. Okay, technologies can be explained most of the time in layperson's terms. And that's what you're going to have to do. That's a challenge, and make it understandable for for people to enable them and empower them. So let's first talk about some of the principles of community development. Um, and some of these are hard to understand, uh, like oppression. Um, well, many social problems arise due to oppression, um, and uh, oppression it comes in many forms. It's, it's in the form, for instance, of discrimination. Um, it may not be discrimination, though. It may just be um, based on um, economic structures. Um, also, it might be based on religion um, and so forth. So this can be a difficult issue to deal with. Um, next the question is, do you treat symptoms or root causes? This is, a, this is a big issue. A lot of times, you know, you, if you go to the food pantry um, in, in Columbus uh, and you get your food, but you're treating a symptom, right? You're not, it's not really addressing a root cause about why people don't have food in the first place. Um, so there's all kinds of problems with sexism, racism, economic systems. Um, there's often justifications for oppression that are common. Um, and in fact, uh, oppression has been pretty well studied by uh, um, Ferrier, a uh, Brazilian, uh, famous Brazilian, um, who wrote a book, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, 
and uh, he, he explains that, you know, <coughs> the press come to a point where they don't want change because they have no hope that things can change anyway. Um, in fact, they may oppress each other. They're at the bottom, but they're, they're sort of beating up on each other in a sense. Um, they, in a sense, they might act like um, the oppressor. I think this point that Coleman makes is important to understand your position of privilege. That is something I think is difficult. You know, um, how many people was really worried about where dinner is going to come from? You know, how, how much do we worry about that? Or how much where your next, uh, you know, coffee is going to come from? Or, you know, you, the, these things are, it's hard to understand when you have to worry about those issues or about health problems or education, you know, wanting to get an education, you know, like uh, Rosa wanting to become a nurse, you know, she, in the film we watched the first day, and it's hard to understand not being able to get something, like get an education when you want an education, when you're here, right, you're getting your education. What if you couldn't do that? Well, how would that impact your life? It, it would impact you significantly. If I had not gotten an, edu gotten an education, I think I would have been uh, a janitor. I enjoyed that, so... But, you know, um, I think it's, it's, it is hard to understand. It reminds me very much of Banerjee and Duffalo's book. Remember, they tried to say, look, we don't have to worry about, you know, turning on the tap and getting dirty water. We get clean water. We don't have to worry about where the sanitation goes. You know, you open the fridge, food's there. You go to the, you know, grocery store. You've got the health care. You've got the doctor. You got, it's just sort of all, like, right there. You know, and it's not for a lot of the people we're talking about, especially those in extreme poverty and under a dollar a day. Um, and then Holman says something interesting here. He believes that um, doing things for people, just for free, is oppression. Okay, that's a little mind bending, but he, he's really opposed to just doing things for people because then it says that we're up here, we're giving you things, you're down there, you're holding out your hands. You know, and it's just a bad situation. So he's, he's like, if you want to continue oppression that these people have had, just give them things. It's, it puts them at the bottom and puts you at the top, okay? So he's very much opposed to that sort of uh, uh, approach, okay? And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, empowerment, this is, a, this is also a bit hard to understand a bit when you're privileged. Um, so it's bad if you lead and they follow. You go into the community as a humanitarian engineer and you, you lead the shuttle. No, you want to be the consultant, essentially. You want to be the coach and let someone else in the community lead. Like the smart woman that's the matriarch, maybe. Like, you know, you want, to, you want somebody to lead someone else, okay? And, and you want to sort of follow and maybe get some advice and help and tell them how to drive. Um, it's good if you work with others and promote their leadership. Um, also, acquired skills. Uh, this is why we teach in humanitarian engineering in the community. Um, teach skills and social connections. Um, and, you know, make people believe they can do things. People can do things. There's tons of talent. This is one of the, it's, almost, it's fascinating and it's depressing. When you get in these situations and you're, you're working with someone and you're like, is as smart as ex professor in my department and you're like I mean it's like I mean it's invigorating it's it's very um, it's great but it's also bad because they never had a chance to get an education at all they didn't finish you know fifth grade or something um, you can tell I mean, I don't know one of the things as a professor I think I do okay it's hard is, is you, after working with some for a while I can tell how much skill they have for certain things at least for electrical engineering, I can tell to a certain extent. Until I start really working with them, can I really tell? But when I'm when I'm working on the ground with somebody, I can tell. It's like, gosh, they're smart, you know. It's just, and you're like, well, sort of shake your head. Um, so what does empowerment depend on? It it depends on your uh, the personal interest of the person and investment in the project. You want to make them feel that they're doing an important part of the project. If you just give them some minor garbage. You know, they're going to be like, I don't matter here. I'm not going to get engaged, right? You want to give people responsibility so they'll take over and lead. Um, they have to have a belief that their possibility of a successful outcome, this is just like with Egan, uh, development recognition of the individual and group resources, 
try to understand. Sometimes it's very difficult to know where the talent is. I don't mean to apply before and I can always tell. I've seen counter examples over the years that have been amazing. Like a student, you know, uh, you know, give them some project and think, oh, I'll never see him again. And they end up, you know, doing graduate work with me. And like, I'm, I have in mind one particular person who ends up being one of my best students ever, unbelievable. So you never know what's gonna happen. You know, somebody can be quiet, kind of shy, and you give them something, they go away and you're like, wow, that was great, okay? Um, give them opportunities to take action and make meaningful contributions. Um, and try to point out the common interest and common risk taking. Um, you know, you got a group and you're, 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 you want people, everybody to understand that, um, how every, everyone understand how they're gonna benefit from being involved in this, each individual, right? It can't be about everybody else. It's gotta be, they're sitting there because they are gonna get something out of it, because then they're gonna willing to invest in it. And they have to understand risk. And whenever you're trying to change something, like put in a new water filtration system or whatever, there's certain risks. It won't work. It simply won't work, for instance. And that's a risk you're taking, and you just give it a shot. Uh, other issues connected to this are decision-making opportunities, tasks. Um, very important to give encouragement. Um, and have a belief in fundamental capabilities of individuals in spite of their station in life, okay? in spite of socioeconomic class, etc. And then recognize contributions. I mean, this is a, something I think engineers, um, at least the engineers I typically work with, often forget to do. Is just say, you know, that was great. What you did was great. You know, and um, you know, we all sometimes forget that in life to say that to our friends or spouses or whatever. Um, so you spread these responsibilities and benefits across the group and participants. Next problem, resisting, resistance to working for change. So the first thing is the so-called sunk cost effect. This is the idea that you invest in a project, time, effort, you know, work, whatever, and it's not succeeding. And you're like, well, we've invested so much in this, we better keep working towards this. When maybe you should just cut it and go for something else. This can be a difficult thing. Um, then we, what we tell ourselves, you know, the, the individuals you're working with, you, you don't know, oh, you're walking in a very complex situation. You don't know how they view you, your country. You don't know um, what their history is and to be able to do anything. Um, they may be very capable. It may be inappropriate that you're even there. And they, may be, they may be very much needing help. Um, they may be telling themselves, we can't do that because they've tried 20 times before. They have no hope. Nothing, nothing ever worked in the past. Uh, last group that came held out all these expectations and big promises and didn't come through or follow through. Um, so the other problem is you say you're going to change something. It ca can cause some discomfort and fear, depending on what you're trying to change. Okay. You, you say, well, what a, I mean, water filtration, what fear could that create? Well, you know, there is a problem. I think when you study water, water filtration, one of the things that comes up is it's not just what comes out of the water, and whether it's drinkable or not, it's the taste. And if you create a new system and the taste isn't good, they're going to be like, they're going to have fear, right? Because they're like, well, this is contaminated maybe in a different way and it's going to hurt me in a different way. Uh, so you got to be really um, careful with that. Um, of course, changing results in unpredictability, which some people, their very nature, do not like. So how do you overcome this resistance to change and sort of get things moving? So you got to organize your time and your assets, okay? Um, you got to share work. These are usually big projects, big problems, and they require a lot of people to get on board. Um, you need encouragement and the benefit of group problem solving. It's important to assess resources. Those are skills, talents, social connections, passion, and energy. You want to identify where all those assets are in the group and in the community and say, look, you know, we've got all these skills and focus on all those positive things. Sometimes I think in humanitarian engineering, there's too much focus on the needs and the problem. And there's, you got all these problems, you got all these needs, and that's all is discussed. That's really the wrong approach. You need to go in and say, okay, we've, we've got all these needs and problems, but we got all these assets. Let's talk about how to use the assets to address the needs and the challenges, okay? 
I mean, that's the right tone. Every community has assets. How can I say that? Because they have people, and every person's an asset in some way. Okay? So it just depends on what they can do. Um, and you might have to remind each other and people why the change is important and the implications of making the change. Part of that can require your expertise. You can say, look, if we, if we get this water problem fixed, we're going to end this set of health problems. We're going to make it so the kids can go to school. We're going to make it so that you don't have diarrhea all the time. And people will be motivated then because they can see sort of why they want they should work. Um, you know, take advantage of training opportunities. That means for you. Um, so start simple. Then decide to act and just do it. Don't study it to death. Just you know, get the work. Okay. Engineers are good at that, I think, generally. They're very, engineers are very practical and or problem solving oriented. So when they see this big situation, they don't study to, to death. They literally start doing something, okay? And what we're talking about here and also in the next lecture is, well, what do we start doing and how do we start? And then reflect. Reflection is very important um, on humanitarian engineering trips. It's often required um, to write in a journal, to meet as a group, to do a trip report, etc. Those are all types of reflection. We'll talk more about that later. So, why is it that in the many times symptoms are addressed rather than root causes? So people believe they don't have the time to do the job right. Problems are hopelessly complex, so where do we start? It might be too much work. It's better to smooth things over than to cause disruption. The people who would be disturbed by changing things are more important than the people who are hurting now. And people who are feeling the problem aren't worth the trouble. Um, and I'm going to give examples in a minute. Significant intervention costs too much, and major surgery might kill a patient. So let me, there's so many examples that come out of this slide, so let me just use one. Uh, the homeless in Columbus, Ohio. There's 14, 1,400 homeless is estimated in uh, Central Ohio. Um, I think that number is pretty far off. Um, the count is too difficult to make. Um, but, you know, let's just say it's between 1,500 and 2,000, something, somewhere. It's, it's a sizable number. So why do we have this problem? Why can't we just fix that problem? Well, you know, who cares? You know, what's your contact with a homeless person? You see them in a the corner when you stop at the exit, and they're, they're flying their sign, trying to get money from you, and they're probably, in that situation, going to go buy drugs. Okay? So... So why should we help these people? I mean, are they just lazy, you know, et cetera? So people have a lot of attitudes about these people, okay? And, uh, or the other attitude is it's somebody else's problem, right? Which is a reasonable attitude in a sense because, you know, um, I don't give money to those people on the corner. And why? Because I'll say, if, if they ask me verbally, I say, I give to the, um, you know, faith mission or, um, whatever I give that's you want to go there and get a meal fine go get their meal I donate to them you know because then I'm not getting my money abused which I think is wrong so so but again though it's a community value issue here it turns out that Columbus believe it or not is a model community for addressing homeless nationwide it's pretty surprising we have actually a good record We're, Columbus is doing a lot of things right but why do we still have the problem? Because, you know, it's, it's sort of like, some of this is going on, I think. You know, are they really worth the trouble? I mean, uh, and then there's the attitudes. We talked about the, the different percentages. 40% are severely mentally ill. How can you or I, as a humanitarian engineer, fix that? Okay? Uh, we can talk about ideas if you want, but there are actually ideas that could be done. But again, what did we do? You know, you think of it politically. This is a broad political context. You know, in the 80s, uh, deinstitutionalization happened. I don't know if you know the history, but that's when this stuff started. You know, the homeless were kicked out of the mental institutions and put, um, they ended up in, uh, on living in the woods or living on the streets or uh, in prison, the ones that commit crimes. So again, you know, we took care of the problem, right? They're living out in the woods, who cares? They're in prison. They're taken care of. Okay. So, so I think that the problem is, is that we, it's it's a it's a fundamental values problem, and there's a, there's also a complicated issue of freedom. 
Because homeless people have a set of rights themselves. If they really want to live outside, should they be able to live outside? That's controversial. Because in the Columbus, Ohio area, it's against the law to live on public land, for instance. And the private land, of course, that's against the law too. Okay, so if you want to live outside, you got a problem. Well, if you don't own the land, you're, you're living on it. So, so there's fundamental issues here that are conflictual. Well, that's why the police can go throw them out. Okay, because they're breaking the law. Okay, but is that the right law? I mean, and you can talk about the laws with respect to the mentally ill. You know, um, the law in Ohio is uh, if they're not going to hurt themselves or anybody else, they're released from the mental institution. That's it. Okay. Now, last year, I visited a homeless schizophrenic man, and I can tell you, I, I wow. I walk away from the situation. I said to the woman that was giving me the tour of the camps, "This is wrong." She goes, "Absolutely, the law is wrong. I'm like, he can't. He, you know, he doesn't want to take care of himself." You know, she feels that we are responsible to take care of him because he can't take care of himself. These are controversial issues. These are very, very difficult issues. Okay, I don't know. I know some about it. I don't know if I know enough about it. I've talked to people, etc. But so, how do we fit? So, what do we do with the homeless? Okay, well, we we give them meals, soup kitchen, food pantries, and you know, they sometimes can go to a shelter. Don't ask what it's like in one of, inside one of those shelters. It's an absolute nightmare from the descriptions I've gotten. I've never been in one, but. So don't think it's like heaven in there. But they get some services, right? So is that enough? Well, those are treating symptoms. What's the cause? You want to get at the cause. So the slide's about, should we be addressing those causes rather than all these symptoms? I mean, throw out all those services and fix the symptoms. I mean, the causes. The causes are where it's at, right? So this is, but this is extremely difficult. These are the kind of things that social workers work on, um, actually. Okay. Um, we want to cover things up so um, we don't look that we don't want to look at, like the homeless. Okay. Um, we fear the possibility that things are out of control or will be um, if we address the basic issues. Uh, it's just a bad habit to look at symptoms rather than causes. Um, how, how are you going to throw out all the food pantries? There's no way. Okay. There's tons of them in the U.S. It's easier to shut up those who feel, who feel the problem than it is to challenge the authority because those in need are less threatening and are appreciative of any help we can give them. Well, yeah. We need to feel that we're doing something. In other words, for our sake, we, we, we can only, it's too hard to hit the root causes. We feel like we need to do something because you might have a big heart, okay, and you address the symptom. Is that bad? My personal opinion is as well, I don't think it necessarily is bad because you're helping end somebody's suffering. You know? And if you go on a humanitarian engineering trip and you know that's all you achieved was ending somebody's suffering for some period of time, well, that's pretty admirable, I'd say, myself. Because it's hard to hit the root causes. I'm not saying not to try, I'm just saying that you know you gotta look at what the good side of things too. Uh, <laughs> I like this one. You're up to your behinds and alligators. Forget the original intention was to drain the swamp. You focus so much on symptoms because there's so many symptoms, there's so many problems, and you forget, well, wait a minute, where are all these problems coming from? Why don't I get at the cause of the problems in the first place? Next, relationships. Um, everything happens through relationships, and I can tell you, oh, this is really true in humanitarian engineering. The, all of our trips, you know, there's nine trips out of the humanitarian engineering um, center this year. Uh, they're all built on the back of relationships. It's who knows whom, you know? I mean, a, a number of these are OSU alumni living in these countries, like in Honduras, you know, uh, the Overholts that are running uh, the, the program associated with uh, Choluteca, as an example. Um, so there's others, too. And then you take Mon and Tanya de Luz, you know, well, their offices are in Worthington, okay? I mean, they were started by a Presbyterian minister here in Columbus. And uh, so it's easy to develop that relationship. So it matters who you know, and this, there's a network going on. So uh, that's really important. But then the relationships also within the community, because when you, when you uh, go and you start working with people, um, those relationships develop, and, and they're very important for getting things done, you know, in the end. 
So it's, it's they come to trust you, uh, they enjoy your company, okay? Um, they can see your common interest and so forth. Cultural competence, this is a hard one. Um, you know, you wanna understand a culture and be sensitive to differences and uh, every time I think I know, a cul the culture besides the US that I know the best probably is Colombia. Um, I had a, my recently uh, my PhD stole, told me he thinks I understand 70%. I thought I was shocked he said that, but and when I'm when I'm in Colombia, I, I don't feel that way. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning. It's it's it, a culture is something you live and swim in and born and raised in. How can someone like me, even though I've been visiting there since 1997, come to understand that without, you know, being a part of it fully, even born and raised in it? That's impossible. I can't understand it. So I still hear Colombians say things, and I'm like, what? Okay, I mean, you know, and, and then I, they explain, 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 and I, I'm not sure I, always, I, I get it always. But this is important to try to gain a cultural competence. I personally enjoy it greatly. I, I, I really enjoy this component of humanitarian engineering. And this applies to the homeless, too, in Columbus, Ohio. There is a culture in the homeless community, okay? There's, there's cultures all over that are, di that are different, that are interesting to learn. Next, theoretical frameworks, uh, Homan, and I could just give him a big hug for saying that first one, systems theory. That's a theme in this class, okay? He describes it more, but I think you would probably understand what it means is you've got this, this community and it's a very complex dynamical system, a bunch of interactions, and you're trying to inject interventions to change things and move it in, our, in whatever direction the community wants to move it in. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, there's this healthy communities uh, perspective that's in a, in a broad sense, not just your um, physical health, but your mental health and health in terms of communications, health in terms of the ability to, be, um, to change things, to grow, to adapt, to be resilient. That's what he's talking about. Close communities, he says, are important where there's close relationships and work that are going on it's going on between people a community that has power so that people control their own lives and none are oppressed or run by some other group like a government um, they can do or they can organize they can take action they have abilities they have what's called agency agency means an ability to do things on your own okay and the initiative and the, 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 the capability to take actions and they really do that and then uh, you can view things from a cultural perspective or a change perspective, their ability to change. A few principles, he, he emphasizes um, root causes and this, this notion of um, praxeology. Praxeology is a very old idea and it's, it's really um, intriguing. Um, so this is the idea, a few of the ideas for praxeology go like this, that people are co-creators, that their actions lead to knowledge and then that knowledge that they create by taking actions in the community teaches them how to take better actions the next time around. And then the people act together, they plan, they learn. What does this sound like? Keep that control, duh. I mean, and we'll talk more about that in, in a little bit, but that's, that's exactly what the, this praxeology is. It's connected to his perspective on um, you know, system dynamics, um, community dynamics. The idea of appreciative inquiry, and this is the, the idea that you, appreciative inquiry is the way that a social worker says, go in and find the good things. Don't just focus on the bad, focus on the good. Assets, resource, social capital. Um, so don't do diagnosis and problem solving. You know, find out what you can marshal, the resor what resources you can marshal to bring to bear on problem solving. Now, there's a, from the field of sociology, this is not Homan's work right here. Um, there's something called a community capitals approach, which is relatively popular. It's developed by sociologists for rural, rural sociology, primarily in the US rural, poor rural areas, okay? And this is very much like appreciative inquiry. So what they look at this is they say, let's identify, you walk into the community, you gotta find out what's good. What are their, and that's their quote, capital. So what's the national capital? That, those are resources like water, um, farmland, features of landscape. There's cultural capital, these festivals or work ethic, other cultural issues. Human capital, who's got what skills and abilities, and including the ability to get and use information. Um, social capital, these are connections between 
people and organizations. So there's two parts of this. There's a bonding social capital. Those are close ties lay a foundation for community cohesion. And there's bridging social capital that involves weak ties that create and maintain bridges. So what's interesting here, these sociologists do these studies and they go into a poor community and they find out how much um, bonding social capital is versus bridging social capital. Then they go into you know, Upper Arlington or Worthington, the rich community, and they do the same study. And guess what they come out with? In poorer communities, they tend to have more of this, these close network of very personal bonded interconnections compared to a rich community, which has more of this. It's like, I know them, I know them, I know all this, these connections. But, it, but in the end, there's, I have fewer close personal connections. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If I'm rich, who do I really need, right? Uh, that's, what's, that's what it basically comes down to. Um, so you identify next political capital, access to power and power brokers. Financial capital, do you have resources for projects? Built capital, so that's the local infrastructure from houses, buildings, streets, water, sanitation, telecommunications, whatever, the, the overall infrastructure. Okay, so you want to figure out all that when you walk into the community so you know what assets you have. Okay, so he has this uh, community development model. I, I took this quote out of his book because I thought it was really summarized a, a good chunk of what he's talking about. So let's read this slowly. He says that community development recognizes sources of wealth or community capital that exist in the community, helps the sources to grow, okay, and links them with one another to get stronger, more capable community. That is so we can solve the problems, right? Um, fundamental of this is a belief that members of the community itself have the primary responsibility for decision making and action. Egan would sit, if he were sitting in class, he'd say, of course, that's driving. Put him in the driver's seat, okay? Identify all the assets, identify the problem, then put him in the driver's seat and let him drive the car. So, so I'm, I'm searching for images, and uh, so a group driving, uh, I, only came, I came up with this, so like a little kid drive, but you know, people do this all the time, it's a really, really bad idea. Um, this you see when you go to the developing world, um, N people on a motorcycle, <laughs> and it's sometimes like, oh my goodness, so, you know, like when we were, you know, we were in Colombia, the, the people carrying these ladders, you know, they're driving a motorcycle, and they got, I mean, a long step ladder. Driving around the motorcycle, a couple guys on the thing. It's like, oh my goodness. But what I wanted was this. Does, do you people, I got a question. When I was in high school, these, some of my idiot friends, not friends, I should say, guys that I knew of, would drive, two people drive. So you take the little guy, you put him on the floor, and you give him the gas and the brake. And you take the big guy, and you put him up top and let him steer. You ever seen this or heard of this? You've heard of it. <laughs> have you done it? No. <laughs> right. Has anybody done that here? You don't have to admit it. I mean, this is <laughs> this is really not a very this is two people driving. Okay. Now I like this analogy though. I couldn't find a Google image, but think about it for a minute. Could they do better than one person? Uh-uh. No way. No way. Okay. And that's not a bad idea for humanitarian engineering. So you're going to walk in and you get two people, let's say. They may be less effective than one person to work with. Ouch. And then you take 100 people. They may be a heck of a lot of less effective than one person. And to bring it home for you, think about your teamwork on your, for your projects in this class. Could you take it and reduce it by 10% to 10% of the people and get it done more effectively? I don't know. Don't raise your hand and say that's true. You're going to boot people off the island, right? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm talking about, though. There's always this, this problem is always there. It is an extremely complex problem. But it's something, as humanitarian engineers, we got to deal with. And we have to deal with this problem. Because, so you can see why I set up the grading strategy now. Because if you think about it, the bigger problem in humanitarian engineering is not the math of finding an equilibrium or something. It's doing cooperative problem solving, working as a group. This is hard. I don't think anyone's good at it that I've ever heard of, except for maybe one team in this class. Um, but my point is, is that it is hard. We have to figure this out. 
somehow we have to figure this out, okay? Um, I don't see good, really great solutions to it right now, um, but uh, we have to accept that the people problems part of humanitarian engineering is more difficult than the engineering. Ooh, ouch. Um, so, next. So, he says, too often we train people for dependency, helplessness, and hopelessness. We train them to believe they can't do things themselves. We we'll give them things, okay? We do this in unthinking kindness in the name of helping. So we say, we're going to help you out. We're doing community service. We're going to give things away. Creates oppression, number one. Number two, just makes them dependent. You know, I, got, I was talking to a guy in El Salvador for dinner a couple summers ago, and talking about this issue with the poor in El Salvador. He says, he says Kevin, look, the problem is, is if we give the poor anything, it's, it's, the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to go and ask for more. But, you know, there's a certain wisdom in that statement. So, you know, humanitarian engineering is not about just like giving things away. Generally, it's about working with people. Now, this is actually controversial, though. I want to admit that it's controversial. Remember what Easterly said. Bill Easterly, we studied him. A one-liner, he said, look, we have to consider simply giving away cash, period. Now, why would he say that? He said it because he's so frustrated that in order to deliver things to the poor, we pay, you know, the World Bank. We pay, you know, all these administrators. And before you know it, and then there's corruption, etc. And before you know it, 10% of the money makes it to the, to the poor person. So he's saying, forget it. Direct cash. Put it right in their hands. It's going to be more effective. If the guy, the man typically, goes out and, you know, boozes it up and drinks away 90%, you achieve the same thing. Okay, and his claim, his basic claim is that's not going to happen to that extent. So why not just give him money? So this is tricky, actually. I have a hard time disagreeing with that point. There's a, there's a nice TED talk on this too by a woman who's saying the same thing. She's saying, "Look, just give the money away. Just give them money." And it, I don't know. Maybe it's the right approach. That's what charity did all these years in religions, right? That's what charity did. Charity was about giving things away. So maybe, maybe they were right. Although, when you be careful if you talk to someone and say that, <laughs> if they if you say that and say, "Oh, Professor Passano said in class we should give things away," you know, they're they're gonna sh send me a nasty email, man. <laughs> Don't say something like that. But show some wisdom and say, "Look, I think it's not that easy." You know, Bill Easterly says, "You know, this is a very reputable guy." I mean, it, I think it's quite complicated. Unfortunately, in humanitarian engineering, engineering, there's cases where you do give things away, uh, like in orphanages, like Montana de Luz. Those are children. You help, period. Because you're not creating dependency. <laughs> you, you are, in that case, <laughs> what you're doing is a child's supposed to be dependent, so you're trying to satisfy needs, and that's perfectly fine. So. Homan goes off on this issue of service. He hates the word, and I'm with him on this one. So um, these are two different things. Development, human development or community development versus community service or just service to people are very different things in his mind. Service, he says, simply does not work, okay? It just addresses the symptom. What does a food pantry do? It gives away food. It's providing a service. He said that's not solving any basic problem. It's addressing a symptom. Uh, then even bigger is the, what he really gets him going in the book is, is, well, if you have service, that implies that there's a giver, right, and a receiver. That's the notion of service, okay? Or there's an expert and there's a needy person. This, what we call this is an asymmetry. So the word service implies an asymmetry. And this is what bothers me personally about this because I don't, I mean, that's just so far from the truth. But I'm talking to somebody on the ground. I mean, it's not like I'm above them in any possible manner. And, and service, using that word service, implies that. So <laughs> I, it, there's big problems here, though. If you want to tell your parents what you're doing, what do you say then? I'm, I'm doing service. 
Well, you probably shouldn't. But it's the way we communicate that idea. I'm going to X country, I'm going to Ghana to work with the people. What does that sound like? I mean, how do you even say this in an accurate way? What, you know, I, I, I helped name engineers for community service back in 0304. I told them recently, it's, it's not the right name. We should change the name. And then that'll never happen. We do service learning courses, right? But the university has an outreach and engagement office. That's for community service. They changed their name because of this issue. So what a lot of people use is the term engagement. I'm sorry, but that's, that's no good. Engagement is like, is like a word with no meaning in this context. It doesn't say, it doesn't communicate, okay? Um, so there is a word, there's a, lang a problem, a language problem here. I generally avoid this. If you, if you uh, do a search on the PDF of the, the book, um, you're gonna find very few occurrences of it. I only did it when I was forced to, sort of by other people's use of the term, and I'm covering their work, for instance. Um, and there's others in the humanitarian engineering program feel the same way about this word. They, they don't like it at all. But I don't like the word humanitarians, but that's another story. Okay.